and she's going to be talking about bioregional learning from the Devon Donut. Isabel is a communicator, educator and large scale project organiser. Her experience in the London art world led her to set up and direct the Festival of Muslim Cultures that took place across Britain throughout 2006. Over 120 events in almost every conceivable art form brought audiences into contact with the Muslim world in order to build bridges of understanding between cultures. Isabel moved to South Devon in 2010 and created and led learning programs for children and young adults with the Transition Network. Since 2012, she has trained in regenerative development and design with Regenesis. She co-founded the Bioregional Learning Centre, or BLC, in 2017 in order to build collaborations to shift South Devon towards long-term climate resilience. BLC works in and at the intersection of economy, ecology, learning, arts and culture and the gaps in between. The team is currently leading the collective that is making a donut for Devon. So, uh, Isabel, thanks very much for your time and um, uh, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. And wow, what a great talk from Daniel. And he's touched on so many things that are, are, are really kind of um, things that we're grappling with here in South Devon and Devon as a whole. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a talk about um, our approach to bioregions and bioregioning here in South Devon and how it interfaces with our work for the Devon Donut. And so I'm going to be bringing in lots of different threads uh, some of which I'm only going to touch on very briefly. So please, when I get to the end of my talk, which is about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, ask me questions if there are things you haven't understood or want to go into more deeply, because I'll be kind of, um, it's, it's a very kind of complex arena, this. I'm just going to be giving you a kind of taster of it. So what I want to do is to start by showing you two graphics that we made. So as uh, Satya has just um, told you, we started the Bioregional Learning Centre here in South Devon in 2017. And it came out of not just kind of many years of observing and interacting with what was going on here in South Devon and getting increasingly interested in not just kind of starting new projects, but how you shift systems, how you meet systems where they are and how you understand how to shift systems, how systems can sense and see themselves, but also how people can build collective will towards that systemic change. Um, and in order to kind of really um, grapple with that in a way, um, we convened a course at Schumacher College in 2016, which is called Bioregions by Design. And that had two people from the Regenesis group in it, Pamela Mang and Joel Glansberg, somebody called John Thackeray, who some of you will know, who is very big in the design world and myself. And this really was an extraordinary crucible in which we kind of honed our ideas about what happened when regeneration meets bioregions. And out of that whole two week long course emerged the idea of the learning center. And um, two people on almost the last day came up to me and said, we're just gonna make this happen. And I thought, fantastic. I have no idea how to make it happen, but let's make it happen. And we've been working together ever since to kind of make it happen. So I'm going to start by showing you what we think um, a regenerated or a generating bioregion would look like. And this is kind of an end goal. It's always useful to have an end goal in mind when you're doing any kind of work. So hopefully you can see that graphic. It's quite big. So I'm just going to let you read the top half. And then I'm going to scroll down to the bottom half and show you the bottom half. So these are the many ways into a bioregion. You can come down almost any pathway and you find out you end up in the same place. And we encourage people to feel that not to be overwhelmed with the complexity, potential complexity of what a bioregion is or what happens in a bioregion, but just to kind of focus on the one thing that makes them come alive and makes them feel excited and want to do something. So you won't be able to see all of this. And I'm happy to um, share this graphic with people afterwards as well, but it has things like co-design and innovate sustainable fishing, investment in infrastructure, regenerating soils to increase yield, farm to table food platforms, and then just scrolling down a bit, citizen science and shared knowledge, mapping and measuring, sustainable fashion, green manufacturing, reconnecting cities to rural, building political will to act, and so on. 
So we know uh, if one was to conceive of a project like that and think we've got to do all of it, it would be it would seem completely impossible. But as Daniel has already said, in many places around the world, all of this is already happening. And one of the things that we need to get better at doing is uh, making making it possible to join all that up and to value the people who are doing this work uh, in such a way that they can see that they're part of a much bigger project. So it's not like you've got to start everything from scratch. A lot of this is already happening. Uh, naming that it's happening and valuing it makes it happen in a much more vibrant way. So then I'm gonna move on to a second graphic, which is bioregioning. So what would you be doing in a bioregion? to make all this actually happen? What are the skills that you would need? So again, it's quite big. I'm gonna just kind of give you a layer at a time. So we call this bioregioning, all the skills and capacities that you would be bringing to the fore. So you'd be working at the edges, working at the interface between urban and rural, for instance, seeing the whole, making the region visible to itself with a clear identity and a sense of belonging, but a fuzzy edge paying attention to systems, like for instance, that picture is of citizen scientists at the edge of our local river, the River Dart. And we're working with West Country Rivers Trust to train more people to be citizen scientists. And we have a whole river project going, which is about access to data and knowledge, but also um, creativity and experiences of becoming water. So here we are, the second row, mapping for vitality one of the first things we did in this bioregion was to run a learning journey around the bioregion so people could actually see what was going on in different places. And it was enormously helpful for us. We got to know the many people who are doing fantastic work. Of course, they're isolated from each other, but people who are really thinking about the future, who are thinking about the importance on our high moorland, Dartmoor, of encouraging biodiversity to revitalize by enabling more meadows to return, meadows with many different kinds of species and flowers and grasses and insects in them. Um, we went around the whole of South Devon looking at coastal defenses, fishing, um, poverty, social enterprise, clean energy and so on. Prototype and learn. Uh, I mentioned before when Daniel was talking, we want to create a learning region confidently working without a master plan and at different scales, adapting our actions in response to learning what does and does not work. And that in a sense is our philosophy for doing this work. Collaborating, responding rapidly to crises through strong networks of connectedness. And in fact, we define resilience in terms of that relationality and connectedness. Whatever happens, you know, whatever project um, comes onto the horizon, whether it's responding to a pandemic, whether it's um, thinking about local food systems, the more connections you have, the more robust and resilient you are and able to respond. And here we are on the bottom row, establishing baselines. And that's where the donut comes in because we knew that we needed to establish some kind of baseline, a baseline of health and a way of measuring, not only that we could use, but any community could use to understand where they were in terms of, of food, energy, water, and so on, or the building blocks of life. I um, We circled around the, do the donut for about two years. We weren't sure if we wanted to use that framework as our baseline, but as I'll, I'll come to say in a little bit, uh, in a few minutes time, uh, it became apparent there was a lot of energy around that and people in Devon wanted to do it. And so we, we embraced that. We also tell how-to stories. Uh, raising the potential of a bioregion to operate at its best, telling a can-do story of resilience and possibility, and that feeds into regeneration, and sharing governance, the valuing natural assets of the building blocks of life, talking about sea, air, soil, and water as common pool resources that we all need to steward. And some of the work we're doing at the moment is uh, creating a charter for our local river a charter that gives moral rights to the river. They're not legal rights, they're moral rights. But this is all about water as a common pool resource and how we share governance and how local people can name the assets that they care about and want to become stewards of. So having kind of introduced you to that thinking about bioregions and bioregioning, 
I'm now going to talk more about what happens when bioregioning meets the donut, and that really gets us into thinking about local economies. So once again, I'm going to share my screen and take you into uh, a slide deck. So here we are. Bioregioning and systems change. And I hope you can all read that uh, definition. I'm not going to read it out because I think you can probably all see it. But we were very keen to create our own definition of what a bioregion and bioregioning is. Uh, there are many definitions out there, but we wanted to kind of bring in the different strands that we've been working with. And here I really want to pay homage to the shoulders that we stand on. So we stand on, on many shoulders, obviously, with the work of Danella Meadows with systems thinking, the work of Eleanor Ostrom around common pool resources, the work of Regenesis Group, the work of John Thackeray, who's written some fantastic articles recently about bioregions, and of course, the work of Kate Rayworth that I'll talk about in a minute. So this is where I live. This is South Devon on the left-hand side. Um, you can see we've got a fuzzy boundary and it's our bioregion is defined by water. We've got the sea to the south of us. To the west of us, we've got the River Tamar, which has been the border, the boundary line with our county, which is to the west of us called Cornwall since about 968 AD, a very long time. I, to the east of us, we've got another river called the Teen. And to the north of us, we've got Dartmoor and where all the rivers in South Devon rise. And I've also situated our bioregion in a bigger bioregion. So I don't know if you can see on the right hand side, Devon is marked. And then there's a city called Plymouth, which is also marked. And so Plymouth is bottom left in the big map on the left. And so you can see how South Devon fits into Devon. But many, many years ago, well, over 12,000 years ago, before the end of the last ice age, when there was no sea between England and France, we had a whole bioregion, a, a huge valley of, of, um, of fissures and crevasses and canyons between the two countries. And that I'm going to come on to in a minute because how we conceive of our, our place, how big is our place, how bounded is our place, is a key question for bioregioning. So I want to take you all the way back to the beginning, to the Neanderthals on Jersey. So you go back one, so Jersey is that little island, which I don't know if you can see, it's kind of in the channel between England and France. And many years ago, when I was a, an undergraduate at Ex Exeter University, which is in Devon, I went to work as an archaeologist on Jersey. I, you can see in the right-hand slide the huge cave where we were working, La Cote de Saint-Brelard, and the two slides on the left and the centre are photographs of the dig, and that's me top left carrying a bucket on this excavation of a very important Neanderthal site. So the Neanderthals were on Jersey about 250,000 years ago, when they were on Jersey, there was no water in the English Channel. And so they were able to look out from their vantage point of La Cotte, where the great cave is, and look down into the plains below and the, and the valleys and the ravines and see the movement of big game, of huge animals like mammoth and saber-toothed tiger and woolly rhino and so on. And we were digging up um, mammoth tusks in the cave because they collected the bones and they stacked them in the cave. But what I want to, the point I want to make here is that um, Neanderthals, as we're discovering more and more, were sophisticated people. They were not the, um, the very kind of um, inadequate pre-humans that had been thought to be for a very long time. They clearly collaborated, they clearly had language, but they also, very importantly for us, they thought in terms of systems. So what we call today things like food sheds or water sheds or wood sheds or stone sheds, the kind of systems for natural resources that we live within, what we never think about, were what Neanderthals and what indigenous people, of course, have been uh, cognizant with, have been living with, and have been shaped by and have in turn shaped 
for a very, very, very long time. And I find this a very encouraging thought because sometimes we think that thinking about systems and systems change is impossibly complicated. Like how can we think in all these different layers at the same time and how can we connect it up? Well, somewhere it's inside us and we all have about two to 3% of Neanderthal DNA inside us. We just need to bring it back again. And we're kind of excited about ways in which we can recover that. So we work through the lens of regenerative design and building relationships of trust and working within this, from within the situation, meeting people where they are, really paying attention to and valuing the experience of the people who live and work in that place I, and not imposing views of the world, but enlarging the scope of possibility of the people that we work with. That is the way that we work. So we don't have any grand design. We don't have a grand plan. We are instead uh, creating, if you like, an energy framework or an energy field into which people can step and in which they're valued and seen and connected. And that's proving in the work of the Devon Donut to be highly effective. So as I mentioned, we were very unsure about whether to work with the Donut or not as a framework for baseline measuring and for data. But there was an event in Devon that happened online in July 2019, in which people um, really started to engage with the Devon Donut. I, they became very excited. It was, uh, it was called Regenerate Devon, the event. And Kate Rayworth sent a video for people in Devon. And I've never seen a chat feed go quite so wild as with people in Devon saying, we've just got to do it. And then nobody stepped forward to make it happen. So I and my colleagues at the Bioregional Learning Centre thought, well, OK, well, let's just step forward and see what we can make happen. What can we do? I'm not going to go into the nature of the donut itself, because I think many of you will already know what it consists of. But let me just kind of say very briefly to outline it around the outside ring. You've got the Stockholm Resilience Centre's planetary boundaries. And they include things like uh, chemical pollution or land conversion, biodiversity loss, ozone layer depletion, and so on. And around the inner circle, you have got the sustainable development goals from the United Nations. And not all of them, but many of them are there on the inner circle. And they include things like water and sanitation, housing, education, food, health, and so on. And Kate Rayworth named that green circle, the donut itself, as a safe and just operating space for humanity. So most of the donuts in the world at the moment are mainly metropolitan donuts. So they're being made by big cities like Melbourne or Berlin or Amsterdam. So we are a bit different because we're covering a whole county. It's both urban and rural. And as I've mentioned before, there's an enormous amount already happening here. Uh, we haven't shown everything that's happening on the little map that's on the slide, but those little donut circles are just pointing to some of the things that are happening and our um, ambition and our, the potential that we're realizing to join all of these things up. So our work in, is in response to citizens sensing the usefulness of the donut which became very clear in the Regenerative Devon meeting and working with policy. So on the one hand, we work with citizen agency and on the other hand, we work with policy makers. So we have the UK government's legally binding commitment to carbon reduction, the declarations of carbon emergency that have happened across our county. So not only have our central government in Westminster declared a climate emergency, but also Devon County Council, which is the governance for the whole of Devon, um, our local regional councils and parish and town councils have all declared climate emergencies. So there's a clear seam of energy here that we can work with. And there's something called the Devon Carbon Plan, which I'll tell you about a bit later. So we've got a working donut. We have contextualized what we call the domains. So the domains are the segments. So whether it's waste, for instance, on the outside or water on the inside of the ring of the donut, they are domains. And we realized that Kate Rayworth's domains were not going to do it for the people in Devon. They were too abstract and they were too remote. So we renamed not all, but some of the domains to make them much more relevant to where we are here. 
because unless people really kind of feel that relevance and get it viscerally inside their bodies, they're just not going to care very much about what we're doing. So for instance, instead of um, talking about a, um, ocean acidification, we're talking about instead about coastal marine health because that's much more immediate for people here. And the other thing I want to say here is that in the, the ring of the donut that Kate Rayworth calls a safe operating space for humanity, we're calling the space for revitalization and we're kind of measuring our progress into that space, which is a regenerative um, tactic, if you like, to kind of set a goal and, and head towards it rather than just taking a selfie snapshot of where we are. So we have these domains. Um, this is just a list of what they are. We also have cross-cutting themes. So we work um, from the angle of tourism or agriculture or manufacturing. They're not domains in the donut, but they go across all these different domains. Um, yeah, so that's kind of one of the, some of the projects that we're doing uh, are angling at the donut from the cross-cutting themes. And we've contextualized our indicators, as I just mentioned. So um, for coast and marine health, for instance, we are targeting the number of fishing vessels out of Devon's harbors that are bottom trawling days per year. Uh, this is a, a straw man, if you like, that was discussed at a recent donut meeting. So what I should mention here is that we have had no funding to make the Devon Donut. We're all volunteers. We work as a collective. We meet every fortnight on Zoom in a session called Coffee and Donuts. And um, we have been doing this since last October. And we have been moving steadily towards a first prototype of the donut that will be ready at the end of October. And in more recently, we've been testing out the indicators for each, each domain. How do we target a situation or a scenario in a domain that will give us a purchase on that domain so that if we start to work into that um, situation, I don't want to call it a problem, but kind of we work into that um, particular issue, it will give us a traction on, on gaining um, towards revitalizing that particular domain. So we tried out this idea Coast and marine health, could we measure the number of fishing vessels going out that are bottom trawling? Why did we want to do that? Because bottom trawling globally releases as much carbon dioxide per annum as aviation does. So clearly, if we could kind of de decrease the amount of bottom trawling, we would be um, seeing a win in carbon dioxide emissions as well as coast and marine health. And we talked to the, um, the harbour master, Brixham Harbour, which is our local harbour, very important local harbour as well. Um, before Brexit, it was turning over, um, you know, tens of millions of pounds a year in fish trading. And he said, actually, it's not a very good idea to target individual vessels because that's going to create bad feeling. Why don't you go instead for marine protected areas? And so we're constantly kind of trying out these different um, ideas for indicators with experts, which we call into our coffee and donut meetings, and we have open conversations with them, which has the, um, the outcome really is that we're kind of connect more and more connected into all of these different sectors and domains. So we take indicator-based action. So behind each um, indicator, there are actions, a whole kind of um, chain of actions, if you like, that we see could be taken as projects in the future. And anytime we go into a domain, for instance, water body health, we look at how it impacts on all the other domains as well. And this is a kind of an aspect of systems thinking that we're all learning to get better at as a collective. So our indicators are twinned. I, you can see, I'm not gonna go into this in great detail, but you can see on the left in the middle, you've got citizen led innovation. On the right, you've got policy change. So for each indicator, we've got these two tracks and we are creating um, action scenarios for both track. And we are holding by regional learning center, which is kind of holding this whole process is also holding the space between citizens and policymakers because we feel that's a space that is a very rich space. It's often a very vacant space as well. The two don't often connect and we are committed to uh, ensuring that connection happens. 
So these are the steps in our process. I, everything that I'm talking to you about, um, most of this slide deck can be found on the Devon Donut website. Um, there's a big slide deck there. You can download it and use it as you wish. Um, I'm just gonna talk you very quickly through this one. So operating from the space for revitalization, which is, if you like, the end goal, the vision of where we want to be, and it relates very closely to that first image I showed you, the first graphic, as to what would be happening in a flourishing bioregion or a flourishing place. So we're kind of all the time we have that at the back of our minds. So we um, select a domain, we look at a scenario or narrative that will give us a contextualized indicator that's specific to that domain. We looked at the find the twin thresholds. We do this in, as a group, as a collective. Um, every week we tackle something different. We bring in outside experts and we test pathways for action, leverage points and potential outcomes. So as you can see, this is co-evolving um, mutualism in action because the more people we bring into the conversation, the ever growing, ever widening conversation, the more people become um, used to or introduced to this process and the more we're learning together and the more we connect and we ask questions of each other. And this is proving to be a very rich way uh, in order to kind of build capacity for change, particularly, of course, for systems change. So what's the best use for the Devon Donut? So we wanted to try this out with the collective, say, what do you think is the best use? Do you want to use it a, as a data tool for targeting or comparison or advancing regenerative econ economics? Um, nobody really went for that. Everyone went for narratives and storytelling. Very interesting. I, we are able to tell a lot of stories via the donut. And they wanted us to light fires all over Devon, i.e. to wake people up and to show them what could be done, to give citizens agency and to be able to hold policymakers to account. Just letting you know I have five minutes left. Fab, I think this is the last slide. So in Devon, our goal is climate resilience, and this is how we define resilience. So I'll just give you a few minutes to read that. Yeah, so I'm sure you have got a lot of questions because I'm probably have raised lots of um, issues in your minds. I hope I have anyway, very happy to answer questions. Thanks very much for the presentation, Isabel. So if people have questions, they can raise their hand um, and you can also write uh, questions in the chat. Uh, if you are comfortable to speak, it is a little bit easier for me to see if you raise your hand though. So first of all, we'll go for Alana. Oh, sorry, it took the time to unmute. Thank you. That, that was really wonderful. So much packed into a, a few minutes. Just great. Thank you. Um, often, I'm, I'm a person that looks at the commons of what's called the land rent. So as a community makes improvements, this is reflected in the increased value of land. Now, a project we have in the city of Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States, is to look at a very distressed neighborhood but the land rent is going to absentee landowners outside of the area. And so we're working to have policy that builds that uh, framework for public finance from the land rent that is actually a community generated value. Uh, do you have in your model looking at land ownership and uh, how much that land rent is is privatized or or transferred outside from the community? That's a great question. We have a slightly different system here in the UK, but private ownership of land is a big issue when it comes to thinking about um, landscape management at scale from a regenerative perspective. And just to give you an example, um, working on our river we bump into issues of land ownership and 
owners of the banks of the river kind of forbidding mm -hmm. access to people and saying, no, you can't make a charter here. You know, we own the land. So clearly, I what the many things we need to do systemically now depend partly, as you're pointing out, on who owns land and how fragmented land ownership is and how difficult it is to get agreement about how land should be managed as a as a as a large landscape scale unit. So how to do that bit? I we also have absentee landlords in uh, South Devon. But what we try and do all the time is to kind of not get hung up on the blocks and the problems. We just kind of try and find workarounds the whole time. So we go for where the energy is and work with the people who are able to kind of show what's possible. And the more we show what's possible, the more we build this picture of a regenerative future, the more people want that regenerative future and the more pressure comes to bear on those absentee landlords who may not be doing um, exactly what we want them to do. So it's a kind of, it's that building collective will and collective impact approach that we take. I don't know if that's helpful. It's not very specific. I know, but it's kind of, I, I think it's also an attitude of mind as to how, how you approach problems. Yeah, you have a, a panel for experts or you, you have a space where you can bring in experts. I, I'm i connected with a, a team that's working with Baltimore of eight or nine experts in the land value tax policy. If you'd ever like to draw upon us, we'd be happy to. That's a lovely offer. Thank you, Alana. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, now we'll uh, got another question from Roar. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Isabel. That was a wonderful presentation. I'm quite impressed with the work that you have done there, and especially in uh, the integration of the donut economy into Devon. Um, I know that Resurgence magazine is in that area, and I've known Satish Kumar's work and, and all that uh, for a number of years. So I'm not surprised that something like this would take place in an area like that. Coming from Norway, um, uh, a, a country and a, and a culture that is very much related to fishing, I was, I'm was i interested in uh, maybe uh, you talking a little bit more about how you approach this issue of bottom trawling because it's very devastating for the uh, ocean ecology. And, uh, and one of the most serious global problems we have. Um, do you have a discussion and do you see some hope around setting aside certain portions or minimizing that uh, type of fishing? Uh, so I would like to hear a little bit more about that. We already have some marine protected areas off the coast of Devon. Um, we've now in the Plymouth Sound, which is the Plymouth Estuary, we also have a new um, marine park, which is protected. We recognize that in our work, both with citizens and with policymakers, um, the policymakers for this kind of action to create marine protected areas sit nationally, they're not local. So we have to kind of look to a different kind of policymaking. But for the more intractable um, issues like bottom trawling, we are going to be working with um, a local university, extra university, in order to call together um, a much more kind of in-depth round table in order to discuss what we can actually do. Um, interestingly, off the north coast of Devon, there's an island called Lundy, which I don't know if you've heard of, but that has one of the first marine protected areas of the UK. So we've got a bit of a precedent there. But how we do this, how we bring pressure to bear is still something that we need to convene a panel of experts around, but also people who've got real power and clout and you can really kind of begin to move the needle on this. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question. Regarding the uh, European Union, now that um, United, I mean, the UK is not part of the European Union. Uh, is there a difference? Is it is it easier to to do it because you, are, uh, you can protect your own borders better? Because one of the reasons why Norway never joined the EU is for the protection of the coastline. So this is 
you know, I, I know there's a, there's a big issue whether, to, you know, the, the positive sides of the EU and the negative sides, but does that play into this at all? Well, it does play into it in the sense that I, there was a dispute recently about the fishing per for permits that the French fishermen had traditionally held the fishing in the channel. And um, Boris Johnson, our prime minister, sent a gunboat to Jersey to um, see off the French fishermen. So yes, I mean, we are being more belligerent about our borders, but at the same time, for many, many years, which probably predate the EU, in fact, we've got agreements about cross-channel fishing. So we have fishermen coming from France, from Belgium, from Holland, to fish in our waters. Um, we also, here in South Devon, interestingly, have one of the only um, informal cross-channel fishing agreements between the fishermen themselves. So our South Devon and uh, Channel Shell fishermen have their own agreement with the channel shell fishermen across the channel and they meet every every year for a kind of um, a space in which they kind of solve their disputes and talk about where to move their pots to and which areas not to pot in and so on and that's not bottom trawling but there are informal ways in which agreements are made as well mm -hmm. thank you I have um, a question for you, Isabel. I mean, you're saying that your role or the role that your organisation plays is to connect uh, the policymakers with the community. And so I'm curious how that plays out in terms of, you know, the authority around policy decision making. So you're making some suggestions, I assume, you know, how are you actually influencing policymakers? How did you uh, start those connections with them in the first place for them to support your project? Any inspiration like that that you have for others who are interested in doing something similar? Okay, that's a great question. So we have policymakers who come to the coffee and donut sessions. They're part of the collective. So Devon County Council and um, people from regional councils, parish councils, town councils come regularly every fortnight to discuss with us. Um, what I didn't mention earlier about the Devon Carbon Plan. So. Um, because Devon declared a climate emergency, it needed to come up with an action plan on carbon in Devon. And what happened was that um, Devon County Council and Exeter University and other um, bodies in Devon got together and they've made the first iteration of a carbon plan. So ways in which carbon can be reduced in Devon. But I, what's particularly interesting, um, if not frustrating, I suppose, is that Devon County Council only has authority over a few areas. It has authority over things like roads and transport. It has some authority over education. Um, it has some authority over things like pollution and infrastructure, like electric vehicle charging. However, we live um, in the UK in the most centralized state in Europe. So an awful lot of decisions are taken at Westminster. So our regional our county government doesn't have an awful lot of authority. So policymakers sit at all sorts of different levels. So they sit in Westminster, they may sit at a, an even higher level. That's a kind of, if we're thinking of bottom trawling, it clearly would not be just Westminster who would be making decisions about this. It would be um, somebody that crosses the channel. I don't know what that would be right now. I, but we, we recognize that you know, our county council has some authority. Our local council has some authority for things like waste collection but none of these things are ready joined up. So we're not waiting for permission to do any of this work. We're just going ahead and doing it. And um, the policy changes that we are pr promoting, suggesting are completely uh, viable. We could make them happen. We would need negotiating with the appropriate policy makers, but there's also a role here for civil society to hold policy makers to account. Um, this is part of the function of the donut is to be able to kind of reveal that role for civil society of holding policymakers to account and policymakers taking account also of the actions that civil society are able to take. Okay, thanks very much. Um, another, I guess, another question that I have, you also mentioned about uh, complex systems and the Neanderthals uh, having the ability to solve uh, you know, complex problems. I have a background as an engineer, so um, it's a, a little, uh, it's a topic that I quite enjoy. Um, typically, when we have complex systems, there's an underlying principle that's guiding that system. 
So I'm curious, you know, from your experience, you know, working, um, you know, uh, working with this project and looking at the problems that are coming up, have you noticed a common principle that is causing or that is behind a lot of these issues that we're finding and now needing to resolve? Wow, that's a great question. I, it'd be easy, it would be an easy answer to say it's about disconnection, disconnection between people and place, but that certainly is part of it. Um, I think that we've forgotten that we live in bioregions, we've forgotten that we live in life support systems, like, you know, watersheds, for instance. I think what the Neanderthals show us is their, their skill at understanding how to support life by working with these different systems, whether it's where to gather stone or where to find the appropriate wood to make spears from, or where to gather medicinal plants or where to catch game. It's like, that's a mindset that we have abandoned. So I think it's the abandoning of that um, original capacity to think in the way that we now need to think that is causing a lot of these problems. I, it gives me a lot of hope to think that somewhere it's innate in us and we can somehow recover that capacity to think in that way. But certainly when we talk to people about water, for instance, most people don't think that their drinking water comes out of the local river. And they don't know that everything that goes through their body goes back into the river via the sewage treatment works that can only take out a small proportion of what we, we put back into the water. You know, the sewage treatment works can't remove plastics, microplastics, it can't remove prescription or non-prescription medicines, it can't remove feed treatment for dogs. It's just that lack of awareness, that lack of um, thinking really clearly about systemic impact. Yeah, thank you very much. I, uh, if anyone has any final questions, please feel free to raise your hand or pop them in the chat now. I'll just give it a couple of moments to see if anything comes through. Carolina. Yeah, uh, thank you, Isabel, for the presentation. I'm curious to know a little bit more how citizens are responding to this project since you're trying to involve them a lot. Is it easy to get their involvement? Um, how they are responding to all of this? I'd love to hear more about that. So one of our ambitions for the, um, the Devon Donut is to have mini donuts all over the place that citizens can use in communities or in towns or in villages or wherever it might be that link up to the main donut. Um, citizens are responding to the climate emergency. There are climate action groups all over Devon now. Um, they're asking for roadmaps. They're asking for ways in which they can understand where they are in terms of kind of you know, carbon emissions or water quality or food production. And we know that the donut can offer them that. So that's kind of, we're at the stage now of um, creating our first prototype donut and they'll be reaching out to all these communities, but it's not difficult to do. I, a lot of them already come to the donut collective. What I should say about the donut collective, which has a, at least 140 people in it, is behind each person, there's an organization and behind each organization, there's a network. And so for instance, there's an organization in Exeter that works with um, people who are on the breadline. So if we want to reach out to citizens in Exeter, we go through them or a similar organization in Plymouth, or if we want to reach people on Dartmoor, we, we have avenues through which we can access them. Thank you. Are there any, here we go, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, Is Isabel, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm a little astounded. Um, there was so much. Um, I too have been working with uh, the Donut Economic Action Lab um, here in Virginia, uh, in, in the US um, for, for some months. Um, I'm, I'm actually utilizing multiple platforms, kind of the collaboration between DEAL, um, transformnet.org and the Wellbeing Alliance. Um, um, 
and this, so the strength of, of the Donut Economic Action Lab alone is, is phenomenal. Um, just kudos for what you're actually doing on the ground with respect to, to transformation and the, and the use of, of, of course, the Donut economic um, model. So I'm, I just wanted to kind of check in and, and, and say how excited I, I am. I, I, I've kind of been approaching this as a consciousness practitioner just in, in network uh, building has just been my basic uh, complex adaptive systems and um, uh, you know, people <laughs> has has, is sometimes poses a, a complex barrier for me. So and I, I'm just really pleased to have been here and, and, and been a part kind of a, of, your, of your presentation and this experience, thanks. Brian, thank you. That's really encouraging to get that, that feedback. Yes, so, so the Donut Economics Action Lab, for those of you who don't know it, is a great resource. I, all of us who belong to it kind of post our, um, our findings, our, our experiments there. And what Kate Rayworth has done very intelligently in a way is that when she wrote her book, Donut Economics, she didn't actually tell anyone how to do it. She kind of gave us this model and said, it's over to you now to experiment with it. And um, those of us who are doing experimenting are able to exchange and we get people from um, who are making other donuts regularly come to our coffee and donut sessions. We have another three minutes left, so uh, Anna. Yes, uh, Isabel, thanks so much. I'm, uh, I'm trying to, to, like, to push the donut here in Rio and uh, it's very, cha very challenging. And I just wonder if you were using the portraits methodology to connect the dimensions, local, global, social, and, 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 uh, and ecological around the specific uh, strategies uh, to connect the domains and uh, as a piece of talk and connecting the community and, uh, uh, and the group itself, which is uh, very impressive. Can you explain more about the portraits methodology? Because I don't know what that is. The portraits that connects uh, local and global and social and, uh, and the ecological around the strategy. I think it's, uh, it's where the workshops are around, basically, uh, when you see the DO methodologies. So okay, you're not fine. using it, just, you're just using the selfie for, I understood, uh, yes, to collect yes. data and uh, indicators and metrics, right? Yes, okay, good question, right. Um, we're not using it, it's really the bottom line, I suppose. So I, we're not using it because we're very much working from this place. So regenerative um, design really starts with the place itself. And we do obviously look at what's going on around the world, but we're completely um, committed and focused on, on the contextualized indicators on what really makes sense to people here in Devon. And obviously we share with other places, but we, well, actually, when kind of we're doing something that nobody else is doing, nobody else is working with the donut in the way that we're using it. And so um, we are helping other people see how to use it in this way. And we were very keen not to get stuck in a portrait or a selfie, but to be always kind of looking beyond into the actions. So what actions can we take to move us beyond where we are now? Um, so I suppose we're just a bit different to everybody else. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the end of our time, uh, but I'd just really like to thank you, Isabel, for presenting uh, your findings and your experiences to the group today. Thank you, everybody. Really